The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alan Blumkin. I'm here with my good friend David Nemec. And uh, we're here uh, for another session of uh, David Nemec's uh, history and trivia. And today we're going to discuss the history of the Philadelphia Athletics. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a podcast on the uh, St. Louis Browns, and the athletics are very, very unique because the history of the franchise, even uh, past Philadelphia into Kansas City and Oakland, they've usually either been great or terrible. There's very, very little in between. So, uh, you know, we figured it would be nice to discuss the Philly A's who uh, lived up to both ends. Welcome, David. It sure did. Thank you, Al. It's always a pleasure. Okay, you want to start? Yeah, the, a- or the Philadelphia A's um, originated in 1901 when the American League uh, decided to call itself a major league. They had come into existence in 1900 under Ban Johnson as the American League changing its name from the Western League but it was still considered a minor league. But Johnson decided to, you know, put all his money in the pot and declare the, his new league a major league. And they operated as such. They went right after National League players, uh, some of whom were, many of whom were under contract, uh, ended up in court, court cases. Uh, the Athletics also adopted the name of the original uh the original athletics were in, uh, going way back to the National Association and they had a team called the Athletic. Uh, they were a Philadelphia-based team. And then the American Association uh, had the Philadelphia Athletics from uh, 1882 to 1891. Uh, they were among the very few teams to survive uh, in for 10 years in the same city in the American Association. But, so Mac brought them, you know, Mac and Ben Scheib, uh, who were friendly and had uh, been cohorts, and Scheib liked the way Mac ran a team. Mac had managed previously uh, the Pittsburgh National League team, and he also he managed in the Western League. And uh, Scheib liked, liked what he saw and brought Mac in. And Mac at that, at that point was a cagey, fiery, uh, guy who none of us ever saw because by the time uh, people our age were old enough to start seeing baseball games, Mac was the man, grand old man of baseball. But in 1901, uh, he was anything but, and the athletics got off the mark by immediately pilfering uh, from the Phillies, you know, cross town Phillies in the National League. Uh, Three, uh, well, they actually, they ended up filtering several. But the key player they got was Mac Lazaway, and close behind him was Elmer Flick and Alfred. They both of them were in the Hall of Fame. And uh, their pilfering uh, resulted in uh, a, a, a tremendous court case. And one of the few that wasn't resolved in favor of allowing the American League to keep the players they had. Uh, more or less robbed from the National League. In fact, the Philadelphia uh, Athletics had to get rid of Lajoie and Flick, along with a pitcher named Bill Bernard, uh, who was a very good pitcher at the time, because the court ruling came down that these players would never be allowed to play in a major league game uh, in Philadelphia. And uh, as they were mem- members of the athletics, that cut their use in half. Uh, you know, they, they couldn't yeah. do what they, they couldn't. They couldn't do just use them on the road. That wasn't going to be enough. So they ended up trading them to the Indians, the Cleveland Indians, who were not then the Indians, but the Cleveland Blues. And Lazuli and Flick 
and Bernard, all three were very key players for Cleveland and made them into a competitive team. But meanwhile, the athletics were not suffering. They had some very good players, too, and they put together pennant winners in the first decade of the 20th century and uh, missed on another occasion. And they won they won, in, what, they won in 19-2, as I recall, in 1905, and uh, then again, they, they could have won in 1907. Uh, there was a very controversial game in Detroit and a ruling that deprived them of uh, what could have been a victory that could have turned the tables and given them another pennant. And, but they remained a competitive team all throughout the first decade of the 20th century and, and ended up going into the teams with a very, very strong club. And it shows because, you know, they had home run Baker there, but they had the first what was considered to be a $100,000 infield. Now it would be considered the probably a $100 million infield. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, and they had home run Baker, Eddie Collins, Jack Berry, and a guy, a very underrated guy named Harry Davis, who was really an early, the early home run king in the American League. And uh, but Davis by that time was pretty near the end of his career. But the others still had a way to go, and Collins had a long way to go. He played into the deep into the twenties, and they did they, they have very, Stubby very McGinnis as the first baseman. Ed, that's right. I, I'm sorry. They had McGinnis. Yeah. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Davis really was over the over the hill by 1908 when they seven eight when they when they got their nickname. Oh, the pitchers were uh, yes. Benny Plank. Uh, Chief Bender and uh, Jack Coombs, who had a few good years you know, with them. And Rube Waddell. Oh, Rube Waddell, yeah. He, he was nuts. You know, he was, they think that he yeah. had attention deficit disorder, you know, but nobody yeah, knew yeah. about that at the time, yeah. No, no nobody really could handle him. Even yeah. Mac couldn't handle him. They just, just kind of let him do, let him be who he would be and hope for the best. And the best was uh, terrific when uh, when he held together, and uh, he was a very competitive player, a very good pitcher, and uh, you know a strikeout pitcher. Uh, you know he caught, compiled well over 300 strikeouts in, in 1904, as, and uh, you know he, he. But by the end of the decade, he was nearing. His the end, and he went to the St. Louis round of three for his final season. But the A's then, they just picked, a, <coughs> picked, <coughs> excuse me, picked up some other very good pitchers who, uh, you know, went on to do good things in, in the teams, and they continue to win. And um, I don't know, you, you could go to a, a 1914 season, no, uh, they won. We, they, they won uh, it was the pennant in the World Series in 1910, 11, and 13. Yeah, and they yeah they beat the uh, Cubs in 1910. They take the last guess, but they think they're ever his chance team. And then they beat the Giants in 11, 1911, and 1913, and then won in 1914, but wound up losing the uh, World Series in four straight to the Boston Braves. And what happened was in 1914, the Federal League came in. And they started making uh, very big offers to players. And a number of the A's who felt they were underpaid uh, decided to bolt. I think both uh, Bender and Plank bolted to the Federal League. And uh, (coughs) Connie Mack refused to meet the uh, Federal League offers. And one of, one of the upshoots of that was that uh, uh, he saw he signed Eddie Collins to a, a fairly substantial contract for the time, and then shipped him to the White Sox. And uh, when Collins went to the White Sox, uh, supposedly he was making a lot more than any of the other White Sox player, and a lot of the ones who were. In, uh, accused of involvement in the scandal, hey, uh, Collins, because he, because he's making a lot more money. I'll continue until David returns. Okay, Al, back with you. All right. 
Okay. You know, you know, and uh, after 1914, uh, they got rid of everyone. And you know, except course, for a uh, few people, they they kept they kept uh, McGinnis. Yeah. Uh, I think they kept Strunk around for a while, and uh, Chris Lord, um, and you know, Jack Lapp. But not the not the major not not the Collinsers and the Bakers. And the Bakers Baker just you know I like quit the team when he wasn't traded and then came back and ended up playing for the Yankees later in his career. But uh, yeah, I don't know how far you got in describing what happened after 1914. But no, I haven't. Uh, not, not not much. But the thing is, is they crashed uh, completely to last place. And uh, in 1916, they were 36 and 117. There was a book that came out several years ago uh, titled As Bad As It Gets, which is uh, basically a day-by-day uh, 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 day-by-day uh, of the uh, day-by-day book of the uh, 1916 A's. And they had two pitches uh, uh Bull Joe Bush and uh, what was the other guy, Elmer? Uh, oh, the Elmer Myers. Jackson Myers and Dave Bush yeah. and uh, Bull Joe Bush won 29 of the 36 games. One of the ironics uh, was that one of the players on the team was Billy Meyer, who would later go on to manage the 1952 Pirates, who won 42 games. Mm-hmm. And, but uh, that team was really, really uh, awful and. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they were trying to uh, you know, give a comparison with that team to the 1962 match, but they finished last every year for uh, what was it, till 19 through 1922. Well, I think except for one year in there. But, but the thing about it is, there was no reason for the team to be that bad. Matt, Matt, Matt either was sulking or trying to save money, a pinch, pinch corners, or, you know save money or just didn't care and it's difficult to determine what it was whether he was demoralized by the 1914 team the way they fell apart uh whether he just decided it wasn't worth it to try and put together and hold together a a really good team uh what went on in his head but whatever it was was a, a disgrace to baseball and if it was done now uh i don't think the other owners uh, in whatever league a team like that was playing in, would sit tight for it. I think there would be really a lot of flack, but there wasn't any really. Uh, the A's no. and the A's, and they were doormats every year. And the other teams, you know, the other teams just went cruise through Philadelphia, uh, won the series, you know, had the A's in. The A's didn't draw particularly well and beat up on them uh, when they came to their town. And um, I don't recall ever reading in-depth uh, picture, including the uh, Norman Mockler, uh, a three-volume three uh, biography of Mac. And he, uh, I don't feel he explored as fully as he probably could have why the teams were not bad and uh, what Mac could have done to make them better. And especially because there were, there were players in the minor leagues that other teams were buying, the leading player like that being uh, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was certainly available to the A's. Uh, in fact, Jack Dunn tried to steer Ruth to the A's. He, and, and, you know, he uh, clued back in, hey, I've got a guy here that's big, big, big league material all the way, and I've got to sell him. I'm, you know, I'm making, I'm in this to make money for my team, Baltimore, and your national league. You know, Ruth's available. And, you know, I don't know if Mac made a big for him, even, even, even gave it a second thought. But this went on all the way into the 20s, and then suddenly Mac started buying players from Jack Dunn. You well, know, I think Jack in 19, Dunn, yeah. I think in 1922 and 1923, uh, after uh, Harry Frazee did, totally dismantled the Red Sox and traded almost everybody who was uh, worth anything to the Yankees, uh, the Red Sox took over as the bottom feeders in the American League for about ten years. Yeah, it was. It was it's, I don't. You know, the Red Sox story 
I don't know what happened. You know, it, it was bad. It really, and Al has made a very good comparison because, you know, because one bad team, really bad team, followed the other really bad team and, and stayed that way for a long time. And there was really no excuse either, Al Price, for Boston to have been that bad for that long. Uh, you know, and it's, but with the A's, the Red Sox had a change in ownership and a change in spirit, team spirit and a change in philosophy, and they started putting together a good team. But the A's didn't change anything. They kept Mac. You know, Shive was still the owner. Shive doesn't, you know, there aren't, uh, there aren't volumes of complaints from Shive that I have a horrible manager, but I'm stuck with him because he owns part of the team. I'd like to get rid of him and like to get, you know, like to get some good players in. I never read anything like that. I don't think anybody else has either. No, so, I, you, you, yeah. So, you were right. You started to put them at 20s. You started to put the, together the second great team, which you know, turned out to be a three year dynasty. He brought up Fox and uh, Mickey Cochran and Al Simmons, and then Lefty Grove, who pitched you know, as you were saying, Lefty Grove pitched for, uh, uh, I was a six years for Jack Bundle with the Orioles in the International League before he was sold to uh, the A's. Yeah. Yeah, it was, that, there, there was actually Fox was a was a was a was a homegrown product. I mean, they did scout Fox. Yeah, they signed they signed Fox and Simmons. Uh, I can't remember where they, I think they got they got Simmons from was it Minneapolis or, so, or someplace in uh, either the American Association. Or, I, I I I don't recall how Simmons came to the age, but these guys started arriving. And they started arriving in, in Carlos, uh, Simmons, Fox, Cochran, Grove, George Earnshaw, uh, you know, Big they, Miller, they just, and, uh, and and they had they had Max Bishop, players, yeah. yeah, Max Bishop at second base, Mule uh, Haas, Mule, Mule Haas, Jimmy Dykes, uh, yeah. Jimmy Dykes, yeah, they had they had a solid team. Big Miller, they had a solid team in every position. And it showed. Uh, by the Yankees dominated the 20s, uh, and uh, there were a few close races after 1920. 1928, they, they made a, the Yankees made a good run against the Yankees. Yeah, and uh, I mean the Washington brush in and broke in. Yeah. In two years in 20, 24 and 25, and Cleveland had decent teams, and Detroit had some decent teams. Uh, but the rest of the teams, the White Sox, the Browns, the A's, not, you know, the A's hadn't the last quite yet, but uh, the rest of the American League, Washington then fell off the, fell off the table after 25, pretty much to 33. And, uh, but the A's by the, by the 19, by 1929 were ready and willing and able to take on the Yankees man for man. And they had an extremely good team. And uh, the same thing happened. They, you know, they won the pennant in 1930. Uh, they won the pennant in 1931. They won the World Series in 29 and 30, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think I have a couple of theories on why he decided to unload everybody from that team. First of all, they had no Sunday ball in Pennsylvania until 1934 because of the Blue Wars. Uh, he... He had, it was during the Depression, and he had no income other than ticket sales because there was no radio or television or any, uh, you know, uh, any other sort of media to bring in revenue. So all they had was uh, with ticket sales and whatever concessions they could sell at the ballpark. And of course, if you're not drawing people, you're not going to sell concessions. But I think that, you know, the, the combination of that... Uh, yeah, was, was very, very uh, significant in the, in the breaking up of uh, that dynasty team. But again, he didn't have to have a team as bad as it was. No. They, they went from the top of the pile to the bottom of the pile. They were right down there with the Browns, who, you know, all throughout the late 19, end of the 1930s, 
They vied for last place. A terrible, terrible team and terrible, terrible record. Well, the Phillies crushed yeah. town. Well, Phillies moved into Shy Park in 1938. And the Phillies and the A's in the late 30s and early 40s, both of them were just, yeah, the terrible, terrible baseball teams. And, uh, and there were, unfortunately, there were some really good players that were stuck on the A's. I mean, they had Bob Johnson. Who, yeah. Who most of his career was spent in a uniform. Sam Chapman, another very good ball player, who spent most of his career in a uniform. They had some pretty good pitchers. Uh, yeah, and, and they didn't need to be that bad because the minor leagues at that point, remember, there were only 16 teams then, and there were a lot of good ball players out there. Baseball during the Depression. Uh, a lot of guys were trying to make a living playing professional baseball. There wasn't well, he, much else available. Yeah, the, uh, didn't the Mac uh, uh, dislike farm teams and dislike the whole system that Ricky had set up with the teams that went all in, like the Yankees and the, you know, and, and later well, on the Dodgers? Want, he, he, they, they, want, yeah, they were signing all these kids and all these prospects. The A's was. He was still waiting for referrals from college coaches, and uh, yeah, yeah. And he didn't want, and he didn't want to spend any money. For no, him. he wasn't going to go out and buy 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 a Joe DiMaggio like the Yankees did. Uh, not 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 a chance. He didn't buy anybody of any consequence from a minor league team in those years. Well, and, the Phillies, uh, yeah, Phillies had to sell any player that became good during those years to keep operating. <laughs> they did. They did. The, the, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it was, uh, you know, it, if you were a Philadelphia fan in, in, uh, from the period, period from about 1935 to, well, you know, through the war, through the Second World War, yeah, you were, you, you were going to have very few fun days at the ballpark, even if you went to every eight A's and Phillies game. There were a few players, you know, Chuck Klein certainly, even in his later years, would give you a good, good game now and then, hit a key home run. But uh, no, he was it when they moved. They moved from Baker Ball to uh, Shot Park. Uh, Chuck Klein's production declined uh, yeah. very, very rapidly. It would have anyway. Russ mm-hmm. where he played, the guy yeah. just didn't take care of himself. But uh, it's 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 sad because uh, a guy like Bob Johnson. We'll never know how good a ball player he really was. He has he has Hall of Fame numbers uh, and, and career totals, but he never had a team. He never was on. A, he was on the Red Sox in his final season, 1945, I believe. But prior to then, he had very very few seasons when he was with any team, that even snow any territory close to 500, and. Um, Mac continued to manage the team, and he had he had players during the war uh, that he, he just never. You look in the book and you wonder, well, how did this guy play three years? Earl Hall, Earl yeah. Hall is an intro of three seasons during the war, and you could probably ask a million million baseball fans uh, who played, you know, during who the what the A's infield was during the war. And other than Dick Siebert at first base, I don't think anybody, any of them, George Kell came up finally in 19, I think 1944. Three, three, I think, well, yeah, and of course they traded him for uh, Barney McCoskey, Barney. who had two good years with them, and then, uh, you know, uh, had back, pro- back injuries that basically ended his career. Yeah. Mm. No, yeah, McCoskey was sad. Yeah, I mean, McCoskey was trying to become a power hitter. And, yeah. Uh, after the four, he had, he had, I think he had 328 in 1948, led, led the team in batting, but he had zero home runs. And prior to that, he had, you know, he had a few home runs. And, uh, and I, I think somebody actually told him, Barney, if you want to make any money with this club, the A's, you're going to have to hit a few out, out of the ballpark. And uh, he went home that winter, winter of 48, 49, and had a rolling machine and wrecked his back on the rolling machine and came to spring training. I think it was either the first or second day. Uh, he had a terrible, terrible incident. 
and his back would, you know, and his back really suffered. And, I, I and never knew that, that 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 part of the story because yeah, he was on the forty it, Tigers that uh, won the Blues in the World Series. Yeah, and he had, he, but Bukowski was a good ball player. Yeah, a very good ball player uh, when he was with the Tigers, but he he somehow didn't never really improved. And his, his rookie season was good. His sophomore season was excellent. And his seasons after that were still good. But then, you know, as Al said, by the end of the 40s, he was, he was pretty much finished as a player. But uh, Mac kept him on as a pinch hitter for a while. And Mac actually, by <clears throat> 1947, he had begun to put together a semblance of a major league team again. After suffering for years in the doldrums, he had, he, had, he had picked up guys like Phil Marshall, Lou Brissy, Ferris Fain. He'd had Pete Suter for a number of years by then. Uh, and Pete Suter is an interesting case because Pete Suter holds the record for the most games played by a player who never wore any other uniform but an A's uniform. I think you asked me that once, and I got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, you were, you were. That that is one of your great catches, believe me, because uh, few people today even have any, you know, can even talk about Pete Suter. But he, in his day, he was a pretty good ball player. Yeah, but they had they had a good team, and they had a fairly good outfield. Chapman was still there. Elmer Vela was a very good ball player. Uh, you know. They had Zerniel for a while. They had they they, they had their share of pretty good players. Uh, and by 1948, they were actually in contention in the August. They were among the top four the, the top four teams were the Yankees, the Indians, the Red Sox, and the A's. And uh, you couldn't count the A's out then. But then the last two months of the season, they really fell apart. Their pitching was not deep enough to to stay to stay with the two. Didn't Hank Majeski knocked in 120 runs for that team? Yeah, yeah. Majeski was a good, really good ball player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Eddie, Eddie Juice, very underrated player. Lead-off hitter, would hit in the 250s, even in the 240s. But he drew over 100 walks every season. Oh, he, he, had hit the, with, hit with, he hit with power, and he was a good shortstop. Very yeah, he underrated had, player. He had the worst average in the uh, National League in 1943 with the Braves. At 185, and then in 1947 with the A's, he had 206, which was the worst. Yeah, yeah. But he, he, he got he got he got better as a hitter the longer he played, and he was a shortstop on, which not too many people know. He was a shortstop on the Cincinnati Reds when they won the World Series in 1940. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, no, I, no. I, was he? I thought. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he played in all seven games of shortstop for that team. And he was one of the three walking Eddies of you know, the late 40s and the early 50s, along with Eddie Stank and Eddie Yost. That's right. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, but Juiced ended up um, bringing down the curtain on the A's, Philadelphia A's, as a poet in, in, well, in their time in Philadelphia in 1954. Yeah, well, he hired uh, his player manager. They had a decent team. They had a pitcher, Alex Kellner, won 20 games in 1949, then went on to lose 20 games in 1950. In 1951, excuse me, 1952, they had at least the last decent team. They finished fourth. And Bobby Shantz uh, was the MVP of the American League, was 24 and 7. Uh, and we'll have won the Cy Young or the American League if they had one back then. Uh, Ferris Fane won his second straight bank title. Well, Ferris Fane had as one of the top 15 on base percentages of anybody ever. Yeah. And they had, uh, in 1951, they had traded to, they had gotten from the White Sox because of Ariel and Dave Philly to solidify the outfield. And they finished, uh, I think it was 79 and 75 that year. The next year, in uh, 53, everything fell apart. Zarnio yeah. got, you know, yeah. Zarnio uh, had a good year, but that's a chance. Came up with a bad arm that uh, didn't, uh, never completely went away. 
and uh, he, he didn't pitch. Uh, he hardly pitched until uh, he got to the Yankees in 1957. The team just completely fell apart. They, they got rid of Fane to the White Sox because uh, after the two batting titles, Mac didn't want to pay him. They yeah. traded him for Eddie Robinson, and uh, then the, the next year after Philly hit, they Philly hit 303, they sent him to the Indians because Mac didn't want to pay him. Yeah, and, and the, the pitching also. Yeah. Know, Brissy, Brissy was traded. Uh, Dick Fowler, who was really a pretty good pitcher in the late 40s, he had severe bursitis, and eventually it affected his iron to a point where he could barely lift it even to, you know, to warm up before a game. And uh, Carl Scheib, who was looked upon as a two-way, possible two-way ball player when he first yeah. came up, a good hitter. And he was a very pitcher. good hitter, yeah, and he said that. He was a very good he and said he that Mac didn't want didn't want to let him become a position player, but they wound well, up with such such aces as Marion Fricano and John Gray, and my favorite of all of them, Charlie Bishop. Charlie Bishop. Or, 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 and they had Bobo Newsom at the end when he was, you know, forty five years old. Yeah, no, they but, did. They did. But they really had a uh, you know when chance mm-hmm. down and. You know, Kellner being a, a 500 pitcher, they really, really, uh, less than 500 pitcher, they re- the pitching really, really was terrible. They had Harry Bird, who won, you know, 15, won 15 games in 1952, and then he became a 20-game loser uh, in 1953, and they shipped him to the, uh, to him, to him and Eddie Robinson to the Yankees, you know, basically for Vic power. But by 54... Yeah, they were so bad in '54. They managed to finish 60 games behind the uh, uh, pennant winning Indians. Yeah, yeah. And three we, games we, behind the '54 win Baltimore Orioles. <laughs> yeah, we, we've talked about this. So that, you know, I was in '54. I was I was living in West Palm Beach, and West Palm Beach was where the A's trained. Uh, at, uh, they had, you know, a, ball, a, a small little ballpark called Tiny Mac Stadium. Uh, and that's where they played their exhibition games. And I was playing with the West Palm Beach High School team uh, that year. And we would have to wait to begin our practice on days when they were, A's were playing a home exhibition game until their exhibition game finished. So as a result, I got to see some really great players for the only time in my life, uh, especially the Dodgers players. Uh, Campanella, Robinson, you know, Hodges, that whole group, Snyder. Uh, was, no, I never got to see them. They were living in an American League town, Cleveland, and the yeah. guys never played there. But uh, that 54 age team that I saw in spring training, uh, they broke up in two, two squads at one point. Uh, one, one squad went to Vero Beach to play the Dodgers, the A squad. The B squad stayed behind play the West Palm Beach High School baseball team. And I got in that game and got one at bat against a major league pitcher who was an actual, turned out to be an actual major leaguer, a guy named Ozzie Van Brabant. Oh, and yeah, yeah, I've heard, I heard that, that you, name, yeah. You've you, you heard that name. You probably know him yeah. around the world, Raz. Yeah. And, yeah, and that was, and, and they really, it <laughs> was really a game. It was a, it was a close game. They didn't hit. We didn't do much hitting. Their pitching was bad. It wasn't good enough to be major league pitching, but it was certainly better than we were seeing in high school. And our pitchers were handicapping these, you know, these second second line ace players. And some of them were really bad. It, it's amazing how depleted that farm system was by the, by 1954. I don't know what they were thinking. The, you know, Mac Connie Mac was no longer. Any part that had any part in the team, and uh, the Mac the Mac family still did, but they were operating on a shoestring, and they just they had to unload the team and move to Kansas City at the end of the year. And yeah, they packed in uh, three hundred six thousand fans that year. <laughs> yeah, and four eighty uh, groups had to suffer the an, an ignom, ignominy of finishing in last place in his only year as major league manager and. 
Well, uh, yeah, uh, here's a little piece of trivia. It's Tony La Russa is the only manager besides Connie Mack who managed after he was elected to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that is right. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Yeah, but it was a, yeah Mac Mac never uh, never believed it, and, and the, the, the the two sons were involved. Roy and Earl were both uh, not exactly the most you know the, the brilliant minds on the block. Earl played Earl played some too for the A's mm. under under his father, and uh, wasn't much of a player to say the least. But, uh, and the Yankees no, arranged the. The Yankees arranged the whole move to Kansas City, which uh, is another story for another time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Yankees had already gotten their hands in the, in, into the A's. And that trade, that, the trade I'll mention, well, uh, the, 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 the power the, 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 the A's. Yeah, the, they brought in the, the man that bought the team was a man named Arnold Johnson, who owned Yankee Stadium, owned the Kansas City Park in the America Association, and had multiple uh, business dealings with Del Webb, who was you know, the half-owner in the Yankees. Yeah. But that, that, that's a story for another time. But, uh, the, yeah, as I said, yeah, the history of being either terrific or terrible has continued. Kansas City, they lost all 13 seasons that they were there at losing records. And Oakland has you know, had two... Two uh, times of glory in uh, the mid seventies and the late eighties and early nineties and the rest of it and maybe a little bit in the two thousands when they had good teams that never really made it to the playoffs. But uh, outside that, they've been pretty bad. Maybe they've it's had a very bad. very up and down history. Yeah, that's yeah, what fascinated me about it. Yeah, it is, especially with all the stuff about Moneyball and yeah, you know, what. Yeah. And how everybody was thinking, well, the A's really have their finger on something. A pulse that nobody else does. And they're going to emerge as, as the, you know, the team that's not with deep, that team doesn't have deep pockets. And they're going to, they're going to, instead of Tampa Bay, it's emerged as a team without deep pockets, but managing to stay in, a, stay in the race year after year after year with, uh, with, you know, very little money. To spend in comparison to other teams. But while, while we're here, I, I just wanted to ask you what, you, what did you really think of the Soto trade? Of the what? The Soto of the trade. What? The, Soto, the, the Soto trade. Well, wa- Washington, uh, Washington is on the 333. And they, they were, uh, you know, they were unloading everybody. The only one they basically kept from that World Series team from three years ago was Stephen Strasburg, who's been on the injured list most of the time, came back this year, pitched four innings, and went right, right back on the injured list. This was not unlike uh, what the A's did, uh, you know, after their two dynasties. Yeah. This team, is, this team has become the worst, uh, war, the worst team in the, Amer- in the major leagues. And... Uh, yeah, and they say, well, they're rebuilding. You know, 20 years from now, they'll still be rebuilding. Well, the reason I'm asking you is because the papers out here and, you know, and even the Times, has, they're building this trade as one of, the, one of the biggest and not the biggest in history. And they're looking, to me, I'm looking at Soto's career. He had a very fine rookie year, led the league in batting the second year, but here he is. He's making, you know, I don't know, he's making bundles and bundles and bundles of money. And this guy, after, at mid-season, he's hitting under 250. Well, yeah, well, and, well and, he's and, playing with Washington. And, there was uh, really no incentive. Well, there, hey, if you don't have an incentive playing with a bad team, well, you know, who's to say, you know, he's, you know, I'm sorry. I don't agree with that. I think you play... You know, if, you, if you're a ball player, the money that's around now, you play all, you know, 100 percent every oh, time now with what you're being paid. And if that's you're not a, that's a whole different standard, story. Washington, yeah. Washington, Washington has a starting pitcher. I posted this the other day, uh, named Patrick Corbin, who they're paying 23 million dollars this year, and is under contract for the same amount of money for the next two years. He's four and 16 with an ERA of over seven. 
Yeah, no, I've seen, I've, I've seen that. And the, I, well, yeah, you sent somebody like that, that out on the mound. Yeah, you know the game is going to be over before uh, the first the winnings are gone. And there are guys, there are there are players that don't produce, and they figure, well, I'm getting paid this kind of money. Why do I have? To, why should I even? Why should I work my uh, tail off to get better? Well, there are players like that. There are also players who are comfortable playing on bad teams. I know there's no pressure. That. That's my whole thing with. Uh, you know, with Mike Trout. So they say, well, he's one of the yeah. greatest of all time. I said, he's, he's played one division series since, he's, since he got in the Angels. The Angels generally, I call the Angels a place where free agents go to die. And he's, he doesn't play under pressure. I, I, I happen to agree with you. I, I don't see Mike Trout as, Mike Trout is a good ball player on a, on a really, really good team. Mike Trout would still be a good ball player. But would Mike Trout ever be the best player on a really, really good team? I don't think so. I don't think so. I really don't. And Otani, Otani, you know, here's a guy who hits in the 250s, wins nine games, and he had a lot of home runs. So he's the MVP because he can hit and he can pitch. But, he, you know, his pitching is probably no, I was horrified. I was horrified by that last year. Because, yeah. uh, you know, how can you be your most viable player in a league where a team wins 70 games, 72 games, or 70 games? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree. And yet, that Trout was, has been MVP for teams like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, and then when I, did, I put this down about uh, one of the arguments for Otani is that uh, they put down, you know, he's like Babe Ruth. They said Babe Ruth never hit 40 home runs when he was pitching. Babe Ruth pitched in a dead ball era. That's right. When he hit the 29 right. home runs in 1919, nobody was hitting that. No. I mean, these people mm-hmm. have absolutely no perspective. No, it's not, you know, I did a thing on Nolan Ryan a couple of years ago. I got such, I created a firestorm. And I says, how can you hate, I said, I don't hate the guy. I don't know him. I said, all I know is, yeah, I put my reasons. I put down that he lost more games than any pitcher in the 20th century. He has a career walk record that will never be approached. He never made any team that he was on particularly better. He never came close to winning a Cy Young award. And all these people do is they look at the hit, no hitters and the strikeouts. That's it. And the, and the length of career. Uh, yeah. And how much of it occurred after age 35 when any all the players of his era Become, who admit or still continue to play well after 35, fall under heavy suspicion. Yeah, uh, and the, 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 yeah, the thing is, is uh, I've stopped. Like uh, there were there were several people trying to tell 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 me that, that Joey Gallo has value. And uh, it, when Joey Gallo left the Yankees, he, he played for them for a year. This year he was buying 160. Was striking out forty percent of his plate appearances, and uh, he just he had almost three times as many strikeouts as hits. He has more than uh, twice as career-wise. He has more than twice as many strikeouts as hits. And they're trying to tell me this guy has value. He's good defensively. He's a dime a dozen. He is good he defensively. Is, well, he is he is good defensively, and he could be a he could be a defensive. Well, he, 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 yeah, and he. he, 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 he He's too too he, dumb to either too dense or too uh, stubborn to learn how to hit. So they finally got they finally hit. got rid of him, but uh, the Yankees finally got rid yeah. of him. But uh, yeah. I, I've reached the point when they, these people start these arguments on Facebook. I I I, I just stay away from them. It's yeah. like it's it's like. Uh, Trying to convince Trump voters, it's impossible. So I said, it's not worth my time or effort or aggravation. No, it's not, you know it isn't. And it, but but there's so many there's so many guys who are close to Gallo in the, in the way they the way they approach the game. You know. Yeah, well, well my friends just said we should establish 180 as the Gallo line. I you know, like the Mendoza line. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you, that, that we've seen stuff in the last ten years. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know, Chris Davis, um, unbelievable what happened to him. And you know, no, they're gonna they have to pay him through twenty thirty five. I know, I know. Yeah, it's, like it's, the, just, it's like the it's like somebody bought yeah. the Bobby Bonilla contract for one hundred eighty thousand dollars. 
That's, um, yeah, it's, That's <laughs> crazy. I mean, it, 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 the whole thing, the whole game is full of insanity. It's the, the, the game today is really. I, I watch it because you know I got enough. Uh, the Yankees and Mets are doing well this year, but uh, it, 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 it's very, very tough. Uh, the Yankees and Cardinals play the, the game Sunday. Nine inning game that went four hours and twenty five minutes. If the Cardinals had batted in the ninth, the game possibly could have broken the record uh, for uh, you know time for a nine inning game. I, I watched the five innings; they were at the fifth inning, three hours. In the fifth inning, I, I decided I had to listen to the rest of it. I couldn't watch anymore. It's interesting because I watched the only game this year that I've watched more than five innings of the night before. When it was one to nothing, I watched that game, and I said, "Am I seeing something that is this really a presentation of a twenty thousand twenty, you know, twenty two game?" Because it was so different from every other game I've seen parts of. Not only in the course of this season, but the last several seasons, I was riveted by the pitching. You know, the Yankees didn't get a hit the entire time I watched. Yeah, I got three hits here. There was there was some strategy. It, it actually was a baseball game, and I was I I could not believe my eyes. And then, then you, I, the following day, had the typical baseball experience of you know what we, what we, modern day. And uh, I will treasure that game I saw. Um, no, that, 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 per chance I turned the uh, dial uh, to the right. So they play yesterday afternoon. The Yankees in Seattle. Yankees get three runs in the top of the seventh to go ahead three or one. The Cortez, who was brilliant up to that point, gets up a couple of hits. They pull him, and they bring in this uh, relief pitcher Abreu, who had a record of allowing two thirds of his inherited runners to score. So of course he he, he comes in with one man on base, gives up a two run home run right away. <laughs> to put to, you know, it was three two. He puts him ahead four three, and they asked Bar, uh, Aaron Boone after the game, "Why'd you bring him in?" He says, "Well, our uh, bullpen was burned out because the night before, after they took Garrett Cole out after seven innings, they used one a pitcher for every extra inning." Yeah. So what? Yeah. They're, they're, they're overworked because they throw fifteen pitchers in an inning. They're overworked. I, I mean, it, it, I it, it's just. And uh, yeah, it's just very hard, to, uh, very very hard to uh, deal with it. And I watch MLB Network. I watch Quick Pitch every morning to keep up to date on uh, what's going on. But uh, tonight they have this Field of Dreams game between the Cubs and the Reds. Two teams that are going absolutely nowhere. And I'm not going to watch a minute of it. It's not worth no. my time. Yeah. No, it's 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 really what's amazing what's happened to baseball. In yeah. Also amazing. I, mean, I remember a decade ago, uh, Trout and and Bryce Harper were billed as the coming superstar of the future. Which was it going to be? Bryce, who hit left-handed, uh, Trout, who hit right-handed. These guys had all the tools. And for you know, for a long time, a long time, and it may still be considered Trout is the better of the two players. But I'm beginning to wonder is now if if it's not going to be Bryce Harper, it seems like to have the more the more significant career. And it's, it's also start to get hurt, you know, for significant yeah, amounts. Yeah. And once that starts, that doesn't stop for a lot of players. So, uh, and and then they're having two more wild cards this year, and uh, the two things I, I I I've read is but, that. Man, they want to they want to increase the interleague games next year, cut down on the end division games, which to me is ridiculous. And the yeah. other thing is they want they want to add two teams, and if they get the thirty two teams, what they're going to do is become like football. It's not going to be four eighteen yeah. leagues; it'll be eight fourteen divisions. Yeah, exactly. And they'll have sixteen players. Teams make the postseason like they do in hockey and basketball, and the World Series will go into December, and they'll play at a neutral field like they had to do in 2020 because of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, you, you, could, you could be right. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, they, I, they, I, they never get anything right. Yeah. 
I yeah, I think they're going to be some yeah, there's going to be some international expansion too in the yeah. next few years, and uh, depending on the world situation, you know, a lot of things with baseball has nothing to do with, and no impact on it at all. Yeah, but, but traditionalists uh, like us forget it; they don't care about us. No, well, you you know, as long as people today, keep paying these, uh, people people keep paying these outlandish prices. And the outlandish concessions. A friend of mine who goes to Yankee Stadium a lot told me they charge five twenty-five for a bottle of water. Yeah, I'm sure. And uh, it's funny because somebody put up a picture of the Yankee Stadium on one of the Facebook groups about, about the new stadium. So I put down the old ballpark was a shrine. This is just another ballpark. And David Hubble, who's one of the guys I do the Puffy podcast with. Uh, said uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's a it, it, it's a it's a diamond surrounded by a food court. Yeah. But it's, this is this is what it is. There's nothing we can do about it. No. But get, getting back to Soto, what's he done since he went to San Diego? I don't know. They think? start they start to hit the, the last couple of games. They want to play the Dodgers. If they got him, they scored four runs in three games. Yeah. But so I'll give yeah. him some time. The guy is very talented. And Josh Bell, who the Pirates traded away, and I hated that trade, uh, yeah. is a very good, very good hitting first baseman. I know. I know. But, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I just want something, I think something is going on with Soto. He's not going to even be a Mike Trout or you know, even a Bryce Harper. Not even close. There's something going on, and uh, I think you know. I I don't know, but what uh, Washington knows something that. Uh, now Washington is just unloading everybody. Yeah, they're awful. They are. Yeah, they're they 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 going into today. They're 37 and 77. I think it is. But they're the only team that has under 40 wins. It's not even the A's have more have wins than they do. Not to say they don't have a plan. I think I think teams are starting to watch Stanford Bay, and they're seeing things there that they can learn from. And I'm hoping that's true. And there are more and more teams that start doing it because we've got to bring baseball back for all all three. Well, right teams. now, right now, you, you, one of the problems now is you've got uh, in the American League you have the Yankees and the Astros, and the National League you have the Mets, the Braves, and the Dodgers. Maybe San Diego. These are the only teams that are given a clear shot at winning a World Series. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I would be willing to put some money on none of them winning it because it's. You know, I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't see. It. I don't see a candidate right now, but I haven't paid that much attention. But we can yeah, well, the Yankees, the Yankees are one. I think nine out of the last twenty-five. That, that, that. And I, I told I told people all the season when they were high as hell. Uh, a while back, I said, do you think this team is on a sick par with the 1961 and 1998 teams in nuts? No, I don't even know some of the players. Yeah, they're, they're, well, I know them because I see them every day, but they had, uh, yeah. uh, there's too many holes in the batting order, and the pitching is starting to, uh, yeah, pitching is starting to uh, sour a little bit. So, but they, they, they've stopped hitting in the clutch. Even when they hit in the clutch, like yesterday, they uh, they bring in the wrong pitches and they blow the game. Oh, I don't know if you heard this one, but the, a pirate uh, player last night was sliding at the third base and he was tagged out, and a cell phone slipped out of his back pocket. <laughs> and it showed he was safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that, that, that's on YouTube. Yeah. That's gone, that, that's gone viral. That that video. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, there were guys that, in the old days that carried cigars in their back pocket. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but I do appreciate that I saw that game on Saturday between the Yankees and the Cardinals. Good. It's the first game I've seen in years. Years. That maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be another one this year. There were sixteen complete games already. Uh, maybe and a pitcher on Miami named Al Contras, three of them. Yeah. But, uh, there'll never be a game in a Sabre convention like it was like in uh, no, 2006 no, yeah. game in Seattle. Not like going. Game like 
No. Yeah, no, I'm not going don't. this year. I can't physically. Yeah. No, I, no, I can't either. But uh, yeah, there's no. That was that was a classic game, and uh, I really treasured it. I, you weren't, you weren't in Seattle. No, it's no, I, I couldn't because I, I, I yeah, it was my last year at work, and I, I, I just couldn't. Yeah. See uh, yeah. that flight. That was the only one I missed from 1984 through 19 uh, through 2011. Yeah, well, and you were missed. I remember you weren't there. And yeah. Us all because, uh, you know, Pete, we were, I was sitting with Pete Palmer and a couple of the Scope and a couple other guys at the game. We were talking. And before we were talking, we suddenly realized it was a sixth inning. And we had just, just feel felt that this game had just started. And it was over before, you know, before we knew it. And no pitching changes, no mound visitation, no disputes, no replays. Nothing. No pinch hits. Pinch hitters. Uh, the game just went. It's played. It's played like a real smooth game. Yeah, my yeah. my favorite uh, was in Pittsburgh in 1995 because we were at the game in the Three Rivers and the pirate pitcher, starting pitcher, was getting his brains beaten in. So I got up to go to the bathroom. So I got up and somebody says, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going out to the mound. I can't pitch worse than him." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's always a pleasure. It is. It's been a lot what, of fun. I said one of the highlights was when you came in. When Steve Nadell told me you were coming into New York in 1991, it's Scott yeah. Scott Flair. I got yeah, all, all crazily crazy excited about that. Yeah, that was that was a fun convention, and you know, yeah. Scott ran the trivia. And, there was there was some great questions. I mean, well, I was really impressed with some of the ones he drew up. And, yeah, well, the, 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 that was my yeah, even though we lost to you in the file. The Branch yeah. Rickey thing was the highlight of my uh, trivia career. Yeah. yeah well, then, well, you and then when you ran it, you 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 you, you put together some great, some great. I, only, I, 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 I learned yeah. from you. Yeah, I learned from all your yeah. stuff. Yeah, but I remember you asking fun. me in Milwaukee. Yeah, you because know, uh, I wrote about half of that. Uh, I said uh, 2001. You asked me which one were yours, was, which one were mine. I said some of them. He said USOB, and I said I only learned from the best. Yeah, well, that, that was yeah, that was a good convention too. And, yeah, yeah, but but those were the days, my friend. And, yeah, um, we, we had a good time. And okay. We're, we're continuing to have a good time, and that's important. Yeah, yeah, uh, I treasure your friendship. I really do. Me too. And I really okay. enjoyed this one. Take care, Al. Oh, you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>